I would be uh, preaching a message. And part of the message that I'm going to pre be preaching this morning is it's going to be called present but not connected. Present but not connected. And to understand that, you can have power to this church. Electricity, and you can have power to this church. But if you don't connect the power, if you don't flip that light switch and connect the power, then it's not going to do you a bit of good. You'll not have any light. I don't care how much power you have available. If you don't make that connection, then it's not going to do any good whatsoever. And, and that message can go a lot of different ways. And we're going to take it a certain way this morning. But you can look at families today. They're present, but they're not connected. The dad's not connected. May, he may work all the time and work all the time. And there is no connection in that family. They're present, but they're really not connected. There's people that may go to church. And they're present there, but they're not connected. So we've got to understand, church, the power is in the Spirit and the Word of God. So if we don't get connected, then it's not going to do us a bit of good. You can have a Bible sitting in every, on the coffee table, in the bedroom, and every room in the house. You can have the Bible sitting there. But if you don't connect with it through what? The Spirit. Then it's not going to really do you any good except do what? One day it's going to judge you. Because you had it. And you had the opportunity. But you didn't do anything with it. So we've got to make that connection. Well we're going to go in another direction. The word of God may, may use an object like fruit, firewood, water, seed. And it uses it in an analogy. An analogy is a comparison based upon some some. Resemblance. Okay. Let me again say what an analogy is. It's a comparison. And the Word of God does this all the time. Through fire, wood, uh, wind, fruit. It uses a natural object. And it, what it does, it makes a comparison of some resemblance. Not all resemblance. You see? Because again... The Spirit of God is lacking unto the wind. The Spirit of God is lacking unto the Holy Ghost and what? Fire. So it's just some resemblance to try to get our carnal mind to grasp a spiritual meaning. See? So naturally, wind cannot depict God or reveal all of God's power and everything about God. But on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Ghost came in as a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And then the Bible says, clothed in tongues as a fire set up on each of them and they began to speak with tongue. You see right there within those passages of Scripture are two natural objects that's being used. Fire and wind. To try to get across to us as humans. You see, God is a spirit. God has no hindrances whatsoever. He knows all things. He understands all things. And the understanding of God is so far above our understanding. And His ways are so far above our ways. But yet, He tries to reveal a part of Him to us. Through what? Through the Word. This is how He tries to reveal Himself to us through the Word. So when we look at these natural objects and, and, and a certain point, okay, in rightly dividing the Word, how many know the Bible said we've got to rightly divide the Word of God? Amen. Let me just give you a little example. So many preachers, you hear them on TV, <laughs> switch the channels one after another. What are they saying? Sow the seed, sow the seed, sow the seed, sow the seed. That's all you hear. And what are they really after? What is their purpose and what is their motive? To get money. To get money. You see? 
So when you rightly divide the word, you take the natural object that God is using and you put it into the perspective of what the word of God wants it to reveal. You see? So therefore, there are these false apostles in the last day that are twisting the scriptures to fit their own agenda. Amen. To fit their own pocketbook. They're twisting the scripture. And even though there are scriptures that talks about the seed. And we're gonna, we preach about scriptures that talks about the seed. The sower went forth to sow the seed. Some seed fell what? On good ground and some fell on stony ground. Is that talking about money? Is that talking about the money fell on, on good ground, the money? No, but they take those scriptures and they twist those scriptures around to fill their own coffers, to fill their own bank account, to fill their own pocketbook. But the Spirit doesn't do that. The anointing, which I want to preach under the anointing of God, and I don't want to walk after the flesh. Because you see, the majority of their television time is trying to get money from people. And trying to tell those people that if you give, $273 is, is, is the number that God revealed to me. Two stands for agreement. Seven stands for perfection and completion. And three stands for the Godhead. I don't even want to attach the Godhead to money. Do you understand what I'm talking about? The Godhead is too holy to attach to anything such as money, which is the root of all evil, by the way. But yet they take those Scriptures from the Word of God, just like the devil did, and tries to twist the Scriptures again to fit their own agenda. And they spend countless hours upon hours of precious television time, which should be for the reaching of soul. Don't get me wrong, I realize that it does take money. But the Bible says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteous. All these other things will be added. Lord, what's the use to try to just preach money, money, money and never reach for a soul? Amen. So, so what I'm trying to explain to you, the word uses natural objects to relate a spiritual message, you see. And the, the carnal mind cannot understand, the carnal mind cannot grasp, they will not receive it because you've got to receive it through the spiritual man. How many knows you've got an inward man and you've got an outward man? And where are you really going to get what I'm saying this morning? It's not through your intellectual ability. Not because you graduated from college. Bless God, I graduated from college and I'm going to understand all things that's in this book. I don't care how many degrees you have. It's not really going to be the interpretation or help you interpret the Scripture because the Scripture is interpret interpreted through the Spirit of God. You see? So when I preach unto you what I seek to do, is get into the Spirit and preach with the Spirit and not with the flesh. Here's what happens. You'll, you'll deal with this yourself. You'll try to straighten people out with the natural. You'll try to straighten people out with the natural. You'll try to get them to quit doing this and quit doing that. If you quit doing this, let me tell you, you can quit doing everything and if you don't have the Spirit of God, you're none of His. You see? So that's where the church world makes mistakes. It's kind of like that old saying, you can't clean a fish till you catch it. But what happens if you're not careful? You'll spend your time trying to straighten. And, and, and I got a message and I, I, I put these fruit tree branches up here and we're going to talk about those this morning. If the Lord's willing, we'll be talking about those. So let's turn, turn to St. John, the 15th chapter again. We're going to repeat these scriptures because we're going to go in a different direction. I am the true vine and my father, father is the what? You're not the husbandman. You're not the vine and you're not the husbandman. I'm not the vine and I'm not the husbandman. The father, the father is the vine, he said, and, and I am the vine and my father is the husbandman. The one that takes care of it. <coughs> 
Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Everybody say, he taketh away. He taketh away. You can't bring them in, you can't get them saved, and you can't take them out. Nobody, no man can pluck you out of the hands of the Father. And I told you this the other day, just like no man, no man can bring you to God, no man can pluck you out of the hand of the Father. Amen. It's going to be your choice. It's like I said this morning. You have got to take your guilt to the altar. No matter how bad you want someone to be saved, they have to come to the crossroads in their life and they have to choose. Because believe me, God will bring everyone to a crossroads in their life. He said, choose you this day who you're going to serve. And He's going to give every man a space of time to repent. It may be on your deathbed, but God's going to give you a space of time to repent. So every man is going to come to a crossroads and make a choice. Broad road that leads to destruction, straight and narrow way. I can't choose it for you. I can preach it to you and I can shine my light and shine my light and shine my light, but I can't make you make that choice. Amen. You have got to take your own guilt to the altar. Amen. And you know what the problem with the world today and the problem with sinners today, they blame in their situation on everybody else. It's everybody else's fault because of where they're at. I'm a drug addict because of what my mama did. I'm a drug addict or an alcoholic because of what my daddy did. But I got news. There's some of you here today. You may have had drug addicts for mamas. And you may have had drug addicts for daddy. And you may have had alcoholic for mama or daddy. But there's, there's people today that's still serving God that was in that situation. Yeah. You see. Well, tell me this. Why is it on the other spectrum... There's people that were raised in church all their life. Let's look on the other side. The whole other side of the spectrum. There's people that were raised in church all their life. And where are they at now? They're out there serving the devil. Who are they going to blame? Who are they going to blame that on? You see, those parents serve the Lord. But it comes a point in your life. The Bible says you must choose you this day who you're going to serve. It's time to quit, quit casting blame on the way, the lifestyle that you had to live growing up. Let me tell you, God knows exactly where you came from. He knows the situation. And believe me, some of them are not good situations. But out of everything, every temptation, everything that you have, my God has already made a way of escape for you. It doesn't matter how deep the pit that you were in and what kind of family you were born in and how horrible a situation you were born in. My God's grace reaches down that far. Oh, Brother Ralph, you just don't know what I went through. You just don't know. I can tell you there's a lot of people who went through a lot of things and they're serving God today as a testimony. Right. Wherefore, see, we're compassed with so great a cloud of witness that went on before us. So, so every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it that he may bring forth more fruit. Now, I told you that God uses these analogies or the comparison of things that have a, some resemblance. How many knows that the, the things that is within us, the fruit of the Spirit, temperance and all that, He just likens it unto like fruits that grow on trees. That things that protrude. The fruit that's going to come out of our life, He tries to compare it to fruit. It is not the complete resemblance, but it's some. Some resemblance. And the Word of God uses the best things that our natural man, minds can co possibly comprehend. So I'm going to take you places, and I'm, I've, I've gone places in the Word that I haven't gone before. And I'm going to tell you what, there was a time that God wanted to reveal things to us, but we were not ready yet. He told His disciples, I have much to tell you, but you're not ready for it yet. 
But I believe now that we're ready for some of the deep things of God. There was a time in Pentecost. You preach a message that you try to stir up people's emotion to make them shout. And some of them still go on down that avenue where you preach if you could just work up their emotions and get a good shout going. And boy, everything, oh, we had a service. We had a service. What happened? Well, we shouted and we danced. Don't get me wrong. I shout and I danced. And I love all that. And I'm going to continue to do it till Jesus comes. But after the shout has fizzled out, and after the dance has gone, and you're facing all hell. And all hell is broke through. And you're in a storm and a dark place that you've never been before. Let me tell you, that preacher can preach, shout. Come on. Come on, shout. Go ahead and shout. I'm going to tell you what. You don't want to shout. For everything, there's a season. It's going to be that weeping moment now. Weeping may enjoy for a night, but joy is going to come in the morning. But you see, it's not going to be those shouting messages that's going to keep you going in these dark places that you have to go through. But it's going to be the Word that you're going to hide within your heart. And it's not going to be these, these fantasy worlds that the preachers are painting today. But I want to paint you a picture of reality. I'd like to tell you once you start serving God, Everything from then on is smooth sailing. But when I read the Word of God, when they started serving God, all hell broke loose. When Paul started serving God, oh, he had it good for a while. But when, when, when he really, really started serving God, all hell broke through in his life. So I'd like to paint you some kind of fantasy world. And preachers think, don't preach anything negative. No negative, stay away from that negative. You can take anything too far. Yeah. you got to be careful. Rightly dividing the Word of God, there's a balance. Right. And you can think, well, you know, I, 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 I can't speak anything negative. And, and, you know, but if you're sick, you're sick. Now you can say, by faith, I'm going to be healed. Right. But believe me, if you burn it up with the fever, you can't say, well, I'm not sick. Right. Well, something wrong with you. No. I mean, if you got cancer, you got cancer. I mean, it's all over your body. You can see. You can see the results of it. Now, you can go, around, you can go along by faith because faith is the substance of things hoped for, but the evidence not seen. You see, the evidence is not seen yet. So you're still dealing with cancer. The evidence of cancer is still there. The evidence of your healing is not there yet. So you can go all around saying, I don't have cancer, I don't have cancer. Or you can be on your deathbed and say, I'm not going to die. I'm not going to die. All of a sudden, you're going to die. What happened? <laughs> Somebody was lying somewhere. Exactly you see? But God's Word makes us deal with reality. So we want to preach messages that just makes people want to live on the mountaintop. But how many knows the majority of your life is not going to be spent on the mountaintop? How many knows, let's look at valleys and mountains just for a moment. The mountaintop. Oh, it's such a beautiful experience to be on the mountaintop. But how many knows you can't live on the mountaintop? See, and, and when you think about, so you spend the majority of your time don't what, climb in the mountain? Huh? You spend the majority of the time climbing up the rough side of the mountain. Then for a little while, you're on the mountain. <clears throat> and then you got to go back down into the valley. And so you're going to spend more of your time climbing up the mountain, going down, and going through the valley. And, you know, it's, it's going to be that way in life. There's going to be good times. How many of you can say you had some good times in your life? When you laid on your bed at night and said, you know, really, I don't have anything to complain about. Y'all know where I'm at. You lay on your bed, you've got money in your pocket, the crawfish are running and doing real good, and the family seems to be all healthy, and everything seems to be going good. But how many of those it's not going to last? Brother Ralph, I don't like this kind of preaching. I want you to preach me on this mountaintop. Let me just stay on the mountaintop. Well, you'd be the only one. 
It'd be a lonely place up there. You're on the mountain top by yourself. Because I found in my life, I have had those good experiences. Because there is a path that no foul knoweth, and the vulture's eye has never seen. And you know where that is? Deep, deep in the Spirit of God. But then, you got to get up and go back and do the thing, contend with the flesh. War against the flesh. So we want our emotions stirred up. We want, we want all those things stirred up. But in reality, we've got to face some giants. And yeah. we've got to face some storms in our life. So what I want to teach this church is how to survive not only on the mountaintop, because I'm going to tell you really, the, the mountaintop can be the most dangerous place to be. Let me tell you something. To me, I, you hear me quote this all the time, and I believe this, this is just something God gave me. The safest place for you is in the heat of the battle. Why is that? Because when you're in the heat of the battle, you recognize your enemy, you know you have an enemy, but when you're on the mountaintop, you don't realize. Man, everything is going good. So I don't even need to pray today. Everything is going good. I think I'll just go and go to church today. Everything is going smooth. So it's on that mountaintop that if you're not careful, you can have, oh, you got so much money. Man, I've been making, I don't really know what to do with it. I just got to try to go spend this money. You know, everything is going good. Everybody's feeling good. Man, I'm feeling good. But you know, when... Here's what David said. David said, help me to know how frail I really am. And you're not going to know your frailties on the mountaintop. You're not, you're not going to become acquainted with your frailties when everything is going good. But when you feel you're frail and you feel you're weak, that is going to be the time you're going to reach out for His help. Let me explain something there to you as well. Your flesh may not. There's going to come times in our life, church. There's going to come times in our life that all hell comes against us and the enemy comes in like a what? Flood. You know what does, what does a flood do? A flood washes everything away that can be washed away. Everything that is not stable, everything that is not secure, it will wash it away. So there's going to be a time, there's going to come times in our life, I've been there, that all hell is going to break loose and the floods are going to come and the storms and the winds are going to blow and they're going to blow hard. And that's going to be the time that this old flesh, I'm going to tell you, you're going to be at your weakest moments. Don't condemn yourself when you feel like, is there even a God? It's not your heart that's talking. Understand this. It's not your heart that's, it's not the inner man that is speaking. Even Jesus said the Spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is what? Weak. The flesh is weak. And how many know we all got it? Just tap yourself. You feel it? You feel it? You've got flesh. And you've got to deal with this flesh. We are not super... Not, we are not super human beings. We are not... And I can go as far as that we're not supernatural human beings. We have a supernatural being that lives inside of us. He lives inside. That inner man is supernatural. But this body is not supernatural. We are not super spiritual human beings. Why? Because we have to contend with this old flesh. And it's weak. And David said, and David understood, if I'm going to keep a right standing with God, I've got to always know my place. That I'm weak. And God never let me forget how frail that I really am. I want to know my weaknesses. I want to know my shortcomings. You know what the majority, of, well, a lot of the church world, you know what they spend their time doing looking at everybody else's shortcomings? 
That's what they do. They spend their time looking at everybody. And if the devil can distract you from your own frailties, from your own shortcoming, then he's going to catch you unaware one day and he's going to lamb blast you with something and he's going to bring you down. That's why the Word of God says, take heed when you think you stand, lest you fall. Know. Know what you're dealing with. Know who your greatest enemy is. Your greatest enemy is really not even the world out there. Your greatest enemy, your old did it. It's called your, it's the closest thing to you. Why? Because you're clothed in it. And that's why the Bible speaks about when he talks about us being clothed with humanity, that we groan. Wanting to be clothed with the righteousness of God. In other words, wanting to get rid of this body. Because this body is nothing but corruption. This body is mortal, nothing but corruption. Heartaches and pains and all these things that go along with this body. But one day we're going to have a new body. But until that time comes, there's going to be times that we're going to go through things in life. And what I want to tell you this morning, God just taking me here, so I'm going to go here, right? We may get to that later. <laughs> but I want you to understand, and I, I told you this, and I'm going to repeat this again because it bears repeating. How many understand when God saw something of such importance, He repeated it several times? Yeah. However many times it takes. How many, how, however many times it takes you to forgive your brother, you forgive him 70 times 7. It doesn't matter if you have to go through the process of forgiving today and forgiving tomorrow. It doesn't matter because that's such urgent. It's such an urgent and re, it's such an important matter that we don't let any unforgiveness get. So anything that bears repeating over and over again, it's of it's a, it's a, such importance. I told you this. And here's what I want you to understand. If the Spirit which raised Christ from the dead dwell in you, it shall also quicken your what? Where does it dwell? Where is the Spirit of God? It's, inside. it's that inner man that lives inside of you. That inner man. And if the Spirit which raised Jesus from the dead dwell in you, it shall also quicken your mortal body. How many knows right now you may be in a position, you may be low as you can possibly get. But let me tell you, if He breaks through the clouds of glory and His Spirit dwells within you, He's not going to go by what you're feeling in the flesh to take you up. He's going to go by that inner man. Because man has the ability to look on the outward appearance and judge according to the outward appearance. But God knows what's within the heart and that inner mind. You may right now feel like you're so backslid away from God. You may feel like you pray and you feel like your prayers are bouncing back. And you don't feel very religious right now. Any of you don't feel very religious right now? And you may not feel very spiritual right now. Let me tell you, Jesus relates to this. He said the spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. Yeah. And, and you may be at the point you are, the, you are at the lowest of low. <coughs> you may feel like God is dead in the flesh. Your mind may be screaming out. God is dead. Your mind may be screaming out. Oh God, where art thou? Don't y'all know Job did that? He said, I looked on the right hand. He wasn't there. I looked on the left. He wasn't there. I looked behind me. I looked in front. He wasn't there. I couldn't find Him. And there may be some of you this morning, you cannot feel God, but you're not going by feelings because there is a Spirit. When you gave your heart to God, God didn't say, I'm going to give you a good feeling. But when the Spirit of God came inside of you, he said, I'll give you power 
over what? All. So why would He give us power over if we're not going to face Him? I mean, does God, is God wasting His power? If you're not going to face heartaches and pain and tribulations and all the things that you... Why would God give us power over anything that the enemy can bring against you? Amen. So here it is. The power resides if you've accepted Jesus Christ. How, many, how do you get it? Come underneath the blood of Jesus Christ. And let the blood of Jesus Christ cleanse you from all sin. And let the Spirit of God come and reside within you. And I'm going to tell you, once you do that, it's not a walk by feelings, it's a walk by faith. That's right. So I don't care if you feel like your prayer is a mountain and coming and hitting you back. I don't care if you've got all kinds of questions in the mind. Brother Ralph, do you ever question? Oh yeah, I question a lot. But it's the, it's the flesh that's doing it. It's not my heart. My heart is secure. My heart is sealed. And I'm going to tell you what. There's nothing going to separate. Paul said, I am persuaded. Nothing going to separate me from God. But the fight goes on. You will say like Paul one day, I have fought a good fight. And what I, I have kept the faith. But where is the faith at? The faith is embedded inside of you. When you got the Spirit of God inside of you, you got that faith that also embedded itself inside of you. So when all hell comes against you and this flesh is screaming out, this flesh is screaming out, my, don't y'all know Jesus said, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? Right. Jesus said that. Right. Well, he should have knew better. But God, they ought to know better. You ever heard that? Till you get there. Mm -hmm. Isn't it amazing how your song changes when you get there? Yes. But God, they want to do something with their kids. Till you get your own kids. You know how that works in church. Mm -hmm. And that, that's really what we're going to be talking about this morning. And I'll just give you a little preview of this. Y'all see what I got here? And what we're going to be talking about is... We're talking about the fruit. Have you ever seen... One fruit branch, look at another fruit branch and say, hey, why are you not bearing fruit? <laughs> Have you ever seen that? No. All this, and, and we've got to understand that church. It's easy for us when we're in a certain position. It's easy for us to say what other people ought to do and what other kind of fruit they need to be producing more fruit. But you know what you better be worried about? You better worry about your own branch. And, and, and I got a lot of scriptures that we want to get in on there. And I don't know when we'll get on them. But you see these glasses I put on here? You'll never see another branch looking at another branch and determining they don't have enough fruit or why not you bearing fruit and so forth and so on. You'll never find that to be. You might say, oh, Brother Ralph, I read in my Bible that you, you know them by the fruits they bear. Oh. Well, we'll get to that and find out who they're talking about. But it's not talking about your brothers and your sisters. It's talking about false prophets if you will only read that. That's why when we're talking about fruit, I said that God, when He uses analogies, you've got to use it in the right way. Because you see, that's why God called preachers to preach. <laughs> Because He anointed them to preach. You know what happens a lot of times? You get in a conversation with somebody. Boy, you get all worked up. Again. You get all worked up about something. Well, bless God, I'm going to tell them. Bless God, I'm going to tell them. You better watch where, where it's coming from. Because He that wins souls is wise. You better watch that your thought did not come from a conversation that you had with somebody else about sister so-and-so or brother so-and-so, you better watch your conversation didn't come from them. And when you're going to talk about it and when you're going to add, you better make sure it came from the oracles of God. Paul said, when I speak, I speak the oracles of God. So that's why as a preacher... I may not always handle situations the way you think I ought to handle situations, but God didn't put you as pastor. Right. God didn't anoint you to get up here and preach. He anointed me to get up here and preach. Right. You see? 
So he put me in this position for a reason. And what do I have to do? I have to seek to get under the anointing of God. And I have to ask, oh, anointing of God, flow through me. Because the Bible says the Spirit searcheth the heart. What does the Spirit search? It doesn't look at the flesh. Right. What do we look at? Well, bless God, what kind of relationship they got with God. Well, I sure don't see any fruits coming forth from their life. You know, let's just jump into this real quick. Kind of get us off a little bit. How many ever read in the Bible about a woman? How she ought to adorn herself? And what does it say? Have you read that and rightly divided that? Let it not be with the outward adorning. But let it be with what? Because the inner will take care of the outward. You, see? you don't do the outward and think, well, if I can put this on, if I can put that on, if I can put this on, and if I can wear this long, if I can wear my dress long enough, bless God, no man's going to lust after me and I ain't going to lust. You're not going to kill lust by putting on a long dress. Now, you might say, well, brother, right? you mean I can wear what I want to wear? No, I'm not saying that at all. Because the inner man will lead you and guide you and all to it. It will take care. If it's able to raise you up on judgment day, and if it's able to quicken this old mortal flesh, don't you think it's able to tell you what you ought to wear? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so let's rightly divide that. Just kind of going on that side, we call this. <laughs> he said, let the woman adorn. Why? And it was talking, what, what was the, what was the, why be the subjection to your what? Own husband. You're not my wife, so I can't. I don't tell you how to dress. And it also said, "Let a woman adorn herself, being in subjection to her." Everybody say, "Own husband." Own husband. So, in other words, common sense would tell you, or should tell you, you don't want your wife dressing like a prostitute. I mean, that's my wife. That's my wife. I don't want her revealing her body to everybody else. That's my wife. That's the one that God has given me. You see? So let a woman adorn herself, being a subjection to her own husband. It actually doesn't even mention anything. Oh, well, it does say godly women. It does say godly women. So in other words, if you're a godly woman, I am not your husband. There was a time I told women what to wear. I did it. Y'all know I did it. I told you kids what they could wear. Yes. I did it. I was there one time because I was living under the law and I was a dictator and trying to be a lord. But let me tell you, I've learned a long time I don't want to try to replace the Holy Ghost in your life. Because there are certain issues. The Bible says you have no need that any man teach you, but the Holy Ghost will lead you and guide you into all truth. There's things that I will teach you because they in the Word of God in black and white in the Word of God. And God intends for me to teach you that. Other than that, you have to let... You can't live it for your kids. Mamas, you can't live it for your daughters. Daddies, you can't live it for your sons. They got to live it for themselves. Amen. Brother Johnny, come up here for a minute. Let me, I, I've jumped over a little bit here, but we're going to just... I like to kind of go with the flow. If the, if the Spirit takes a right-hand turn, I take a right-hand turn with it. Now, Brother Johnny has pretty well, all of his life, I would say, ever since I knew him, he kind of looked like this. <laughs> Outward appearance, right? Kind of had that beard and, and same kind of clothes, and pretty well same kind of clothes. That's pretty well how he's looked mm -hmm. all his life. So what has changed about him? It hasn't been his outward appearance. That has changed. But I can be tell you there's something that took place. I hear reports. I hear I hear people talking. I hear people. Lord have mercy. And I'm gonna tell you, brother, there's people that's come in contact with Brother Johnny. They they, they haven't determined that he is changed by the clothes that he got on. They have determined there's a, a light that is shining and protruding from him that goes beyond the outward appearance. Now don't get me wrong, Brother Johnny's not going to put on his little days and boots and put on a little, you know, nothing and go around halfway naked. But you see, I think the inner man will take care of that, don't you? 
I don't need to tell. I have never once had to tell Brother Johnny, Brother Johnny, go put on some decent clothes. Because when you truly get him in here, he's going to truly work every aspect of your life. It might not be according to what you think. It might not be according to your opinion. Oh, I got a definition for that. But I have never one time had to tell Brother Johnny to change his outward appearance. But there was something on the inside of him that when people see him, his own family and others see him, I hear God's that man changed like, and here's the word they use, that man changed from like daylight and dark. Or we could just, just say dark and daylight. Put it, put it in the right perspective. He changed from darkness to light. Why? It's because he has a testimony about God. He's not afraid to talk about God. He loves to come to the house of God. He loves to hear the word of God being preached. What does that have to do? It has to come from that inner man that is inside of us. There's some people that talk constantly. Oh, bless God. Now look at me. I'm a Christian. I wear this and I wear that. And you never see them in church. You see? And, and, and never get me wrong. Never, I will never come against any of your convictions. If you, if you feel like you need to wear your dresses to the floor... Wear your dresses to the floor with a clean conscience. Amen. If you feel like you need, there was a time he would change hair. She had such heavy hair, she had headaches all the time. But I refused to let her cut it. Yeah. I mean, it hung down below her knees. And if you feel like you've got to do that, believe me, I'm all for you. If it's something God put in your heart to do, you do it. Amen. You can be seated. Well, I want to say something before I leave. <coughs> That's like this morning when I woke up. I, you know. I listen to him preaching and all that. But anyhow, first thing I do, I call George out there and, you know, he tells me about what he's doing. And then EJ and them, they got him a camp and both of the thing. We're trying to get them situated. Mm -hmm. And uh, I called Daniel this morning. He's doing all right. He's going to be back next week, if the Lord will. But he's still having mm -hmm. trouble in his throat. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, that's just like me. When I came back to the Lord, I said, I done like this. I went forward. Morgan and my neighbor, they know I don't, I don't do nothing. I go with my, with my sons and them, just like we were praying yesterday. Up yonder, we was up there. And, uh, and I could tell people, my own son, I can say it. When they started praying, my son left out of the place. See, you can tell when the, you're of God or not. Just like I told y'all when I was in Morgan City looking for this person. I was walking and the band was playing. And when I was walking, I, I'm asking God, to bring me through, because the devil was trying, he's yeah. trying his best to get to me, but I don't let that happen, because God wants you to do yes. the right thing, and yes, you know, amen. Right. So, so one thing we're discussing, put this down for a moment, <laughs> you'll never see this branch, and let's say they're connected, you know, we, and I got another message on disconnecting, but let's say they're connected to the vine. You're never going to see this one looking. And some of them like to wear double, double eye. They, they love to see other people's fault. <laughs> and they're going to look and say, well, how much fruit you got? Did you ever pass a fruit tree and hear a fruit tree ask another a branch off the fruit tree? Have you ever passed by and heard them ask another branch? Hey, how much fruit you got? I got more fruit than you. I got more fruit than you. No. <laughs> They will never look at another fruit tree and try to compare themselves with the branches of another fruit tree. And we got a lot of scriptures and we're not going to have time to get into them today. It's kind of like, I told you, it's almost like my mind explodes when I start studying. It's almost that powerful. Where my human body cannot comprehend, actually comprehend, because God has just given me so much. And I want to give it, I want to give it, but we're only capable of comprehending a certain amount at a certain time. So there's so much more that God has given me that I want to share that kind of goes along and enforces these scriptures. How many believe? Not one scripture is of a private interpretation. I got scriptures to back up these scriptures, you see. So, 
So when we look at the Word of God and we see see how the Word of God comes alive, you see, and He uses these comparisons of the fruit tree to try to get us to to understand a spiritual concept. Okay, what we need to be worried about is our own fruit. Amen. Am I producing the fruit that He wants me to produce? Mm -hmm. So be careful. Be careful. You might say, well, Brother Ralph, what is my job? Bless God, I'm to tell them. I'm to straighten them out. Really? Is that your job? I thought the Bible said your job was to let your light shine so men may see your good work and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Yeah. Yeah. You see, a lot of times we want to straighten them out. But I'm going to tell you, you can get them to quit doing this and get them to quit doing that and get them to quit doing all these things. But what I'm working on is trying to get them to come through those doors. He that winneth souls is wide. So if I can use enough wisdom, and that's why again God called me to preach. You see? If I can get a, if we can use enough wisdom, and I'm teaching you the wisdom that God has given me about winning souls. He that winneth souls is wide. We got to get them through the doors. And once we get them through the doors, let the preacher preach. You go out there and let your light shine and testify. Well, am I not to do nothing? Yeah, you're to go testify. Testify. Let your light shine. And, and, and people will see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So there's a job that we have to do. And, and then when we get them to the house of God, the Word of God will go forth under the anointing and minister to the need. Okay, we're not going to be able to get any further than this this morning because, you know, I wanted so much more, but I feel like we've got quite a bit to digest now. And we're going to look into, if, if some of you want to look at these scriptures, you can look at Matthew 7, 1 through 5. Matthew 7, 15 through 21, and you'll find out. You, oh, well, there, there are some other scriptures too. Like, he that is spiritual judgeth all things. And you know, oh boy, that, that gives me the lee leeway. Well, we're going to. I want you to also look up the definition of judge. And you'll find that judge means one who gives an authoritative opinion. And how many knows your authority only goes a certain ways? Yep. His authority is lim unlimited. So right. we've got to write that. That's what we're going to do. Don't y'all find this is interesting? Yeah. When we rightly divide the Word of God, a lot of things that we've been taught through the years, the Word of God maybe hasn't been rightly divided. But when you rightly divide, you don't take any scripture out of context. So that's in 1 Corinthians 2, 15 and 16. Then Romans 12 and 1. Romans 14, 1 through 14. I wanted all these this morning, but I didn't get them. Galatians 6, 1 through 4. And did I say Matthew 7, 15 through 21? And Matthew 7, 1 through 5. Those are scriptures that we're going to eventually get to. How many of you want to be not only present, but you want to be connected? Amen. I've given you the source that can connect you. It can connect you. Praise the Lord. Okay, are there any prayer requests this morning?